Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Professor Salmer. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I would like to uh, talk a little bit today about uh, cranial cruciate ligament uh, index. Uh, the reason why I have chosen this topic is, is uh, uh, that, that uh, both the clinical aspect and the research uh, in, this, in this field uh, can easily show how uh, anatomy uh, and subsequently histology uh, can join uh, together the clinical disciplines uh, both in, in, in a veterinary and, and a, a human uh, orthopedic field. Um, on the other hand, also, uh, I love joints. I, uh, it's, it's, it's my passion. I have uh, worked for a long time, both as a clinician and an, as an anatomist uh, in, in Brno. Uh, so uh, it is, for me, it would be great to, to find out uh, why uh, uh, that cruciate ligament fails in dogs uh, and other species, of course. Uh, so there is a lot of controversial information with regards to, uh, to cruciate ligament failure, uh, but before uh, I will get uh, to talk about it, uh, just for you uh, who do not know or are not really familiar uh, what really cruciate ligament is. Uh, so it is a, a, a ligament which we will find inside the stifle joint, inside the knee joint, uh, and it is primal primarily a stabilizing uh, structure there. Uh, I'm saying just primarily because it does perform other, uh, other, other uh, function. It is, it is um, highly innervated. There is a lot of neural receptors as well. But for the purpose of this, uh, of this lecture, I will just stick really to, uh, to uh, it being just the stabilizer uh, of the stifle joint. Uh, Anatomically, it basically connects, as you can see on this picture, uh, on the right side of the screen, it connects the tibia uh, with uh, the femur. Uh, and it is composed of two bundles, uh, which are spiraling uh, next to each other. Uh, and that's quite important to mention, because this is uh, very similar to what we see in people. Uh, uh, human uh, cranial or anterior cruciate ligament in people uh, looks almost, almost identical uh, with both uh, the, the structure of it uh, and also uh, from the point of location within, within the stifle joint. And therefore, dogs do serve uh, very often as, uh, as a model animal uh, for orthopedic research uh, in human field. Uh, it prevents cranial uh, movement uh, of the tibia. Uh, but in addition to that, and that's very important, that's why a lot of surgical procedures fail uh, in, in, in this field, because it also prevents internal rotation of the tibia during full weight bearing. Uh, and when we perform orthopedic surgeries, both in, in people and uh, uh, in dogs, uh, we are not able to address both of these movements. And that's why inevitably, uh, there is no ideal surgical or treatment method to fix it 100% inevitably arthritis develops in the joint. So uh, that's very briefly to, to what's, what, how, how the anatomy, how the anatomy uh, looks like. Uh, uh, why does it, uh, or, or why, why do we talk about it? Because, because the, the, the rupture, and now strictly talking about small animals and dogs, it's one of the most common orthopedic procedures uh, or conditions, uh, rather, uh, in, in uh, small animals, mainly in dogs. In cats, it seems to be the same, yet it is perhaps a bit, bit uh, underdiagnosed. Uh, there are some breeds of dogs uh, who tend to be predisposed, and uh, those vary from small breeds like Yorkshire Terriers uh, to large dogs, Great Danes, uh, San Bernards, and so on. Uh, on the other hand, greyhounds, for example, or whippets, you will almost never see a cruciate rupture there. And what's interesting about these, these, these uh, uh, cruciate ruptures is they almost never, uh, or the owners almost never report any uh, traumatic event. Uh, so these patients basically, they just 
get up from lying position and start to be lame, lame severely, that they are usually not able to weight bear uh, at all. So uh, there is no preceding trauma uh, to, to, this, uh, to this rupture. Uh, and therefore it is often referred as so-called non-contact uh, injury or non-contact uh, rupture. Uh, as I already mentioned, there are many, many treatments, but none of them completely addresses this problem. Uh, and inevitably, it leads to instability in the knee joint, a formation of arthritis, and a constant, uh, constant pain. Uh, interestingly, there was a study done a um, few years ago in, in the States, which was looking into the economical aspects of the treatment uh, of the cruciate ligaments uh, in dogs, and, and uh, it reported, I believe, that the number was over two billion uh, US dollars spent on treatment, uh, different types of treatment in dogs per year. Uh, and again, yet none of these uh, treatments is really 100% successful. Uh, so, uh, clearing or, or or, or, or getting more understanding into why uh, the cruciate rupture does happen uh, and perhaps being able to predict that and, and select dogs which, which are the carriers of, of this problem, uh, that would be, be a, a great benefit to, to, the, to the field of, of orthopedics. And I believe that, that anatomy together with histology uh, plays quite a major, major role uh, in, this, in this field. Uh, as I probably, or you already understood that that's a condition which, which uh, we don't understand why, why that happens. There are many studies which uh, try to look into that, again, both in, uh, in human and, and, and veterinary fields. Uh, uh, the general consensus is that, that we know that there will be some biomechanical issues uh, in the stifle and perhaps some physiological or, 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 or biological ones. So, so if we look at the biology side, uh, um, poten potential biologically initiating factors, they can vary uh, or the reports vary from simple infection inside the joint. Uh, both viral uh, and bacterial uh, to, to hormonal uh, or developmental, developmental issues. Uh, on the other hand, we have the, the biomechanics or, or the anatomy of the stifle or the whole limb, which might potentially predispose uh, the, 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 the knee or the cruciate ligament to subsequent failure. Uh, the question here remains, uh, which one of these is real initiating factor? Is it the biomechanics which then disrupts the biology of the cells or physiology of the cells? Or is it the other way around that the, uh, the cells uh, or the abnormal physiology will alter the biomechanics and that will lead to failure? Uh, it, is, it is a difficult thing to answer, uh, at least based on the current data which, uh, which we have. Uh, and uh, if you were to ask me as a maybe anatomist or a, or a clinician what I do believe that could be the reason for, for this to happen, I think I would be leaning towards the, uh, the side of uh, biomechanics uh, or uh, abnormal or altered anatomy uh, of the limb or the knee, uh, knee joint uh, itself. Uh, why so? Um, difficult perhaps to, to explain with regards to, to um, understanding what we are looking at uh, while diagnosing the cruciate rupture, but I would like to try to uh, maybe show it to you on a, uh, a study which we have carried out, carried out um, a couple of years ago, which is a very basic uh, or utilizing very basic principles of anatomy and histology, uh, and uh, which uh, was looking at some of the uh, uh, anatomical abnormalities of the stifle joint, specifically tibia and the femur, uh, and linking them with potential changes, uh, cellular changes or structural changes inside the cruciate ligament. Uh, so what we have, we have measured quite a few uh, values in the stifle, but, but just for simplicity, simplicity, I have chosen uh, the tibial plateau uh, angle, uh, because I think that's, that's the most common uh, characteristic measured in the stifle joint by, by orthopedic surgeons during certain surgical procedures. Uh, and 
explain on this uh, abnormality or angle uh, of this tibial plateau how it can affect the structural changes of the ligament. So uh, let's, let's have a look at, at the anatomy, uh, or just very briefly, the anatomy of, uh, of the stifle and the proximal part of the tibia. So on this uh, left uh, uh, picture, that's the radiograph of the stifle joint of an adult dog, uh, where you can see the proximal tibia and, and the distal femur, of course. Uh, what we are looking at here, that uh, blue dotted line here, is crossing through the joint surface of the tibial condyles in a, in a, in a dog. Uh, specifically, that would be medial condyles, which we are really measuring. Uh, and we're looking at the angle uh, in relation to the longitudinal axis of the tibia. So I will measure this angle here in this area, which can vary uh, in dogs from, from um, 15, 16 to, to uh, 45, 49 even, in exceptional cases. Uh, here, interestingly, in, if you look at the uh, human uh, tibia, uh, then this slope, it's much lower. It's around five to seven degrees. Uh, so I think that's, that's the major difference from, from dogs and, and, and humans. So uh, we, we measure the, 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 the tibial plateau slope here, and, and uh, this red line, it just represents for, for uh, clarity where the cruciate ligament is located in the knee joint. Uh, on the right-hand picture here, uh, that's just to, to see uh, what really uh, is affecting uh, the tension and the forces acting through the cruciate ligament. So uh, uh, it was described many, many years ago by one of the surgeons who developed one of the techniques which helps to, to, to treat the cruciate ligament. And uh, uh, he uh, described the, uh, the knee joint as a, as a, a cartwheel on an inclined plane. Uh, and if you put the cartwheel on an inclined plane and you will not bre have brakes or you will not be able to, to uh, stick it there somehow, it's going to slide down. So that would be the cart really are the femoral condyles which would be sliding down on that, on that blue dotted line. Uh, the red line, that's the rope which is holding that cart in a position. And if you look at this slope uh, and if we will change the, the position of it, and it's, the steeper it becomes, the more pull there will be on that rope. So uh, the more strain will be put on the ligament and, and as, uh, it has to react somehow to this, uh, uh, to this, to this pull. So uh, what we concluded is that, of course, then uh, this area must somehow affect perhaps the structure of it. Is it necessarily a reason for the cruciate ligament to rupture or not? That still remains to be answered. Uh, but uh, certainly, it, 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 to me, it looks like a plausible uh, option. Uh, so we, we, we had a look at the, at, the, at the ligament, what's happening structurally in the ligament, just simply utilizing a basic histology. Uh, we have, in addition to that, done uh, some of the immunohistochemistry, but uh, I just for the clarity, I'm sticking to the, to the uh, hematoxylinosin staining and Alcyon blue staining. Uh, so uh, over here you see uh, slides from a ligament uh, which has been uh, taken from dogs which had the slope less than 24 degrees. Uh, it is considered that dogs who have uh, the angle less than 24 degrees are highly unlikely or much less prone to cruciate ligament rupture. And uh, if you look at these ligaments, uh, almost 100% of these ligaments were uh, well developed with, with, with typical structure, parallel collagen fibers, uh, with nice uniform distribution of fibrocytes within, within the ligament. Uh, looking at the extracellular matrix, uh, there was minimal amount of proteoglycans. Uh, if we increase the slope, uh, this is how the structure starts looking. So um, this is the, the, the extreme uh, range from more than 30, 31 degrees. Uh, and here you can suddenly see that there is no typical uh, organization of the fibrocytes anymore. They are not nice and parallel. Uh, they do change their shape as well, and they somewhat start to clump together, creating uh, clusters of cells. Uh, which were uh, identified, or we identified them as chondrocytes. Uh, 
There was an increased amount, of course, of proteoglycans as well, as you can see how, how the Elshin blue staining uh, has, has developed nicely. Uh, so the conclusion from, from this, this basic uh, uh, research was that, yes, the, uh, the increased uh, slope does create changes within, within the ligament, which, which uh, create uh, or form a uh, uh, cartilage metaplasia in, within, within, the, within the ligament. Uh, by the way, these changes were found only in the center, on the core uh, of the ligament itself. Uh, if we look at uh, the knowledge about uh, characteristics of the cartilage in relation to, to forces acting on the cartilage, cartilage is amazing in withstanding compression forces, but it is not so good uh, in the tension forces. So, of course, there is a very high tension in, in the cruciate ligament. So, again, is this the reason? Is this uh, uh, perhaps uh, adaptation to increased stresses uh, then resulting in a rupture? Uh, I think it still remains to be answered because uh, the drawback with that is that if you look at these two dogs, they are both the same breed, German Shepherds. Uh, German Shepherd is one of the breeds which is prone to cruciate ligament rupture. But if you were to take uh, the x-rays of their knee joints and you would measure the, the, the tibial plateau slope, you will likely get the same result. And maybe that's going to be around 28 degrees. Uh, but this dog is highly unlikely to have a ruptured ligament, just basically based on the observation what you see in the clinics. And this German Shepherd is highly likely to have a cruciate ligament rupture. The reason also for that is that if you look how they are standing, Okay, this German Shepherd is much taller. You can see the straight line of the of the spine, uh, and if you look at this one, they have a very low back, so their knee joints are flexed quite significantly. And uh, the more they are flexed, the less strain it is putting on the on the cruciate ligament. So the the the, the conclusion from from that is uh, that we need to look at the cruciate ligament as a, as a, as a multifactorial uh, problem, a uh, problem which uh, cannot be identified only one by one single entity, uh, but, uh, or one single angle or, or abnormality of one single bone, but as an individual as a whole, uh, ideally as a whole limb, uh, which is then subsequently affecting other parts uh, of the joint and uh, uh, the, the stifle, the stifle itself. Uh, so, uh, what would be future steps? Uh, once we know this, I still believe that the biomechanics is the uh, main culprit uh, in in the in the cruciate ligament rupture. However, uh, we need to look into more detail, uh, into more detail from the point of view not to do just uh, individual parts, but but looking at the whole limb. Uh, and not just the anatomical aspects, but, but and that's our, that are our, one of our future plans in the, the anatomy, or at least my, uh, to uh, start looking what is happening with regards to the cruciate ligament and uh, the cells on a molecular level. Uh, uh, there is quite a high uh, increase in, in, um, in um, interest in exosomes, for example, uh, certain uh, um, uh, inflammatory mediators which could be triggered uh, or is suspected to be triggered by uh, uh, these changes within the structure of the ligament which then subsequently trigger uh, inflammation inside the joint which then uh, finishes the rest and, and leads uh, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the rupture. So, uh, uh, I think that this is just to show you how, how anatomy um, can help with, 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 with clinical, uh, clinical studies and uh, how it uh, still is relevant uh, in the field of, uh, of uh, veterinary medicine and veterinary research, that it's not uh, just a subject uh, for, for teaching the students. I would like to thank you for your, for your attention. Thank you.